Thank you, Susan, and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking uh, Ruben and Dr. Coleman for the kind invitation. As uh, some of the speakers before me said, this uh, meeting has kind of become a new, a, an institution of itself uh, and um, always attracts a um, lot of attendees and something that everyone looks forward to. So I think the very fact that we are talking about P53 in myeloma tells, already tells us that we have started looking at myeloma not as one disease. As was uh, already mentioned in the last talk, uh, we are increasingly realizing that one size does not fit all. Myeloma is not one disease, even though it was not named multiple myeloma for the same reason, but it clearly seems like we have multiple myelomas that we need to deal with. And increasingly, we realize that it is the genomic substrate that really differentiates these different types of myelomas. And obviously, if you were to make uh, huge strides, especially if you were to cure this disease, we really have to start thinking about these are different diseases and start treating them differently. So uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so why do we worry about uh, the, the TP53 uh, gene? Now, you know, the human body is an, is an amazing machine uh, with lots of checks and balances, maybe even more so than our current government. Um, but the, um, it's the most important uh, thing is the P53 has been the most studied gene by the oncology researchers, not for a variety of different reasons. One is when it's normal, uh, it is our, uh, it's, it's the guardian of the genome, and that is what prevents most of us from uh, getting a cancer uh, during our lifetime because when a cell is damaged, it initiates the machinery to uh, put the cell, the cell cycle is stopped and the cell undergoes death through a variety of different mechanisms. But once it's mutated, it actually becomes the worst enemy that you can think of because literally your cell is now immortalized and the changes just continue to accumulate over time and eventually it can lead to a variety of different disorders, the primary one amongst them being cancer. Now when you think about the, uh, the TP53 abnormalities in myeloma, you can think about it as two large groups. One of them um, you know, being a subset of the other, um, but again, it's the, the form that we commonly recognize in the clinic is the one that is associated with a loss of 17P or the short arm of chromosome 17 uh, that leads to loss of the entire TP53 gene. Or a monosomy uh, 17, which leads to, again, loss of the uh, entire gene uh, locus. And what we, have, what we know is this is uh, something that increases in prevalence as the disease evolves over time. The second set is the mutations that involve this gene. And a variety of different point mutations have been described in the context of the, the P53 gene. Um, and it's very uncommon at the time of diagnosis. And, but its prevalence as with the deletion, as with the deletion 17P does increase uh, with uh, multiple uh, disease relapses and remissions. And it's very commonly seen in myeloma cell lines. So let's first look at the uh, 17P deletion or the monosomy 17, which is what most of us think about uh, or most of us can detect in the clinic because we uniformly do fish testing on myeloma cells in these patients. Um, so there are multiple studies that have shown um, both from large um, co cooperative group studies as well as single institution studies that the prevalence of uh, deletion 17P or monosomy 17 in newly diagnosed disease is roughly about 7 to 10%. In relapsed disease, it can be substantially higher uh, even as common as <clears throat> 20 to 30% of these patients. And it does uh, overlap with the other primary genetic abnormalities, as you can see from that Venn diagram on the right side. It can be seen in patients with trisomies, 1114 translocations, 414, any of the other primary abnormalities that we know exist in myeloma cells. Now, why do we worry about it? Because we know that loss of that one allele, um, or the deletion 17P, can have disastrous consequences in terms of their outcomes. Uh, so as you can see here <coughs> in the red color, the patients with deletion 17P uh, has a very poor outcome, both in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival. PFS on the left, overall survival on the right. And they do much worse than the standard risk patients. There's a Minnesota bug that I can get rid of. Um, so um, even, the, even though the PFS seems to be quite comparable between the high-risk translocations and the 17P deletion, when you look at the overall survival, you can see that the people who do the worst amongst all those patients with myeloma are the ones who have um, a 17P deletion. 
More interestingly, what we have found was we also looked at a group of patients who did not have 17P deletion at diagnosis, but developed it during the course of the disease. And we identified a control group of patients who had similar uh, duration of follow-up, but did not develop a 17P deletion. And as you can see here, the people who develop a, a 17P deletion, they obviously they surely do worse than people who don't. But what was most interesting was that if you look on the right-hand side curve, the blue line represents the people who actually developed a 17P during the disease course. The median was about 12 months. You can see that the moment they get that deletion 17P, their outcome almost parallels what you see in someone who actually had a 17P deletion right away from the beginning. So clearly, you know, we don't know the cause and effect relationship, how much of the 17P deletion mechanistically actually makes the tumor more aggressive versus uh, is it a surrogate marker for something else bad that is happening in the myeloma genome. Now, there are several groups have shown now that it's not just the presence of 17P, but it's also important how much of a clone you have that actually carries this abnormality. Now, the French originally came up with a 60% cutoff, which they felt was where the significance of having a 17P deletion was, cl was clinically evident. And more recently, from a large genome project, um, uh, th this publication that came out earlier this year, again demonstrated that if the clonal fraction that carried the 17P deletion was more than 0.55 or more than 55% of the clone had the 17P deletion, that's when you really started seeing the difference uh, between uh, difference in terms of outcome between those who have it and who don't. Now, moving on to the next aspect of P53 abnormalities, which is the TP53 gene mutation. Now, a lot of, you know, over 2,000 different myeloma genomes have been sequenced through a variety of different studies. We have a good sense of the recurrent mutations that we see in myeloma, the most commonest being NRAS and KRAS. And right after that comes the the P53 gene mutations. And one of the interesting things that we have found, um, that, that has been found, but we don't have a good explanation for, is the fact that almost all the TP53 mutations that you see happen in the context of those patients have already been lost or already having lost one of those uh, uh, TP53 gene through a 17P deletion or a monosomy 17. So here you can see that among the TP53 mutants, almost all of them were found amongst the group who had a 17B deletion with a clonal fraction that was more than 0.55, suggesting that these are sequential events. You first lose one of the alleles, and then you mutate the remaining allele, uh, leading to um, the bad outcomes. Then the important question was, did all the bad outcome in seen in these patients actually come from the mutation, or does it come from the deletion itself? And I think you know, this is something that continues to be debated, but based on some of the data, it seems like the dominant effect of having a 17P deletion uh, that we observe in the fish usually happens when the remaining allele also gets mutated. As you can see here in the red line, which are the patients with a clonal fraction for 17P deletion, which is more than 55%, and also has a 53, uh, P53 gene mutation in the remaining allele. So clearly, um, you know, they, they are interacted. It's, they, they interact with each other. And one of the things that we have seen when we did the study of accurate 17P deletion was that the people who tend to develop the 17P deletion over time are people who had high-risk disease to start with, high proliferative rate, and so forth. So it's usually a question of bad begetting bad. So uh, if you are, have a bad genome to start with, you're going to get worse faster than the, the remaining people. So then the question is, okay, so this is bad. What can we do about it? Are there some, is there something that we can do to treat these patients differently? So I think there are different approaches. They can, you know, we could either look at a specific drug that might work better for these patients, maybe a specific combination that might work better, or maybe even a, a treatment approach that might work better for these patients. So let's take a look at the data we have. Now, this is the Hormone trial, which actually randomized patients to a traditional VAD. So this trial is quite old or a combination that includes bortezomib in combination with atrimacin and dox, um, dexamethasone. And these patients could get one or two transplants, and then they continued on either thalidomide maintenance or bortezomib maintenance. So the question was, you know, bortezomib starting from the beginning till progression versus thalidomide starting from the beginning, or VAD followed by thal maintenance. 
Now, what they found was with long-term follow-up, as you can see here, the patients with 17P deletion, which is in blue color, their outcomes were quite similar when, uh, to the patients who were treated, uh, or in, in other words, the patients with the 17P deletion who were treated with a botasimib-based regimen, their outcomes were very close to um, uh, the patients uh, with this, without the 17P deletion um, who, um, in the other group. So clearly it seems like by using a botasimib based regimen right from the beginning, and especially when you're getting a tandem transplant in this setting, you seem to do, have a better outcome than what we would historically anticipate. Now there are other drugs, for example, lenalidomide, the data with the use of 17P deletion isn't that strong. Here on the left-hand side is uh, a, group, a study that looked at the overall survival for patients with 17P deletion treated with lenalidomide. Um, and on the right-hand side, again, um, patients treated with lenalidomide with, with different underlying abnormalities. And you can see that um, um, you know, the outcomes are um, poor in the, uh, poorer in the presence of a 17P deletion. But I think it's not a question really in today's age about one single drug being able to overcome the adverse effect of any one prognostic factor, 17P or any of the other ones that we talk about. I think it's more the question of drug combinations and the approach that we take. Now this is data from Emory where they looked at a cohort of patients with 17P deletion who got stem cell transplant and was followed by a combination of botasimib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone whether you call it consolidation or maintenance, that's what these patients continued on until disease progression. And they were able to show that by using the triplet, you had increasing depth of response over time. But most importantly, the patients with 17P deletion did much better than what has historically been seen in that patient population with other uh, approaches. So clearly, um, using multi-drug combinations for a prolonged period of time certainly seems to be a strategy that might work for these patients. What about the role of transplant? We know that even in the setting of stem cell transplant, patients who have a 17P deletion uh, do poorly compared to the ones who don't have a 17P deletion. So clearly, it is not by, by itself an answer to um, the problem uh, that we have with the 17P deletion. In contrast, there's some um, data that supports the use of a tandem transplant approach in patients with 17P deletion. There is, you know, as has already been talked about, there's significant controversy about the use of tandem stem cell transplant, and I don't think there's a role for this approach in everybody with myeloma. But I think there is some provocative data um, that uh, should at least make us think about it in the setting of 17P deletion. This is, again, uh, combined data from multiple phase three trials uh, that were done in Europe that was presented by Dr. Cavo, where he was able to show that patients with a 17P deletion of 414 translocation, uh, if they got a tandem transplant, their outcomes were much better than getting a single stem cell transplant. Um, even though the effect was seen in the overall group, the effect was most pronounced in patients with high-risk disease, suggesting that this intense treatment approach may have a value in those patients. Now, whether it, this thing really holds true in the setting of patients getting a PI plus IMIT combination for a prolonged period of time in the context of a stem cell transplant is unclear, and many of us in our own practice don't routinely do a tandem autologous stem cell transplant in those patients. But I think in the context of somebody getting an induction therapy with a VCD regimen, like what the Europeans had done, then I think tandem transplant might be an option for them to intensify the therapy uh, when they don't have the access to that imid pi combination up front. Now, all of the new drugs have been studied, and it's really hard to tease apart, you know, is the drug doing something specifically for the 17P deletion? You know, you take any of the phase three trials that have been done, you know that the, the new drug or the triplet compared to the doublet will always do better, whether it's standard risk or high risk, but the impact on the high risk, whether it's differentially better than what has been seen in the standard risk is often hard to discern because of the small subgroup sizes. So this is the uh, carfilzomib dex versus botasimib dex trial. Again, the high-risk patients and the standard-risk patients both benefited with a very similar hazard ratio, with um, not a similar hazard ratio, with a less hazard ratio for the high risk than the standard risk. Here's the data from the ASPAIR trial. Again, you can see that both ben seems to benefit. Maybe here the hazard rate or the hazard ratio is quite similar for the standard and the high risk, suggesting maybe there's some equivalent degree of benefit for both. There's data from the elotizumab trial. Uh, again, ELO Lentex versus Lentex. Uh, there's certainly the people who are the 17P deleted as a subgroup that looked at those, and the 414, they seem to derive a benefit from the 
triplet versus the doublet, but whether it's something unique to elotizumab or just having three drugs versus two drugs, it's really hard to discern. Some of the data from the exasmib trial was quite interesting because for a change, we actually saw that patients with 17p deletion um, actually had a PFS that was quite similar to the patients who did not have a 17p. That is not a finding that we commonly see in phase three trials. Again, with a grain of salt, this is a very small subgroup of patients. Uh, again, with the context of daratumumab bortezomib dex, this is the CASTRA trial. Again, you can see that the high-risk patients who actually um, uh, get the um, uh, daratumumab dexamethasone clearly does better, and maybe uh, it gets a benefit to the same degree as the standard-risk patients do. We find a similar findings in the Pollux trial, which looked at the Dara Lentex versus Lentex. Again, you can see that by adding uh, daratumumab to lenalidomide dexamethasone, both the high risk and the standard risk patients seems to have derived a similar degree of benefit. But the big question then is, you know, obviously we will continue to evolve these quadruplets and triplets and the new drug combinations for all myeloma patients, and they are all going to get up used also for the high-risk patients, including those with a 17p deletion. But what we really need to do is to look at uh, drugs that have mechanisms which may be particularly suited for uh, the 17p deleted patients. So there have been attempts to try and see if we can get to the mechanism of um, uh, why the, the, the cells with the, the TP53 mutation or the P53 deficient cells, how they survive. So again, trying to specifically target those cells which are deficient in P53 might be the way to go uh, in order to gain you know, further advances in that particular subgroup of patients. So what are the different things that we have in store? I think the one that's cl closest to the clinic are the, um, are the ones that target the P53 MDM2 interaction. We know MDM2 and P53 has a, uh, you know, it's a check and balance uh, system that um, again allows uh, the P53 activate, uh, activity to be very tightly regulated. So by inhibiting that, we can really upregulate the P53 gene um, transcription and activity. And the hypothesis being that in patients who are already lost one of the alleles, maybe this may be a way to really compensate for that loss. Whether this would be an approach in patients with uh, 17P or P53 gene mutation, it's really, you know, it's theoretically it's unlikely, but something we don't have really data on. Uh, we are in the process currently of doing a trial that is looking at the drug called idosanatlin in, uh, in combination with exasamib and dexamethasone for patients with 17p deletion, where we are looking at some of the genomic studies to see are we having an impact on the clonal fraction and is that impact equal in patients with the 17p deletion versus the ones with the 17 or oh, p53 mutation. So clearly there's a lot that needs to be learned uh, about the role of 17p. Um, deletion and or TP53 mutation in patients with myeloma, both newly diagnosed and relapsed. And this is a subgroup of patients where if we can make even a small change, that actually can be a significant impact uh, for the patient. So I'd like to conclude by saying that you know, P P53 gene damage or loss or loss of function by deletion or mutation has significant impact on the outcomes in these patients. The mechanisms of acquisition are not very clear. Uh, but clearly something that we really need to understand better. And we also need to understand better why the 17p deletion of the P53 mutation uh, translates to the clinical outcome that we see in these patients. I think the best thing that we can do for these patients is to try and use the best regimens we have and the best approaches we have to try and get these patients to a minimal residual disease negative state. And this is one group of patients where I am willing to change therapy based on MRD testing. You heard all the controversies about how we use the MRD testing in the clinic this morning. But I think this is one place where I'm willing to go out on a limb and say, do whatever you can, but try and get these patients to be MRD negative, because that is one thing that seems to make a difference to these patients. And obviously, I think that we'll continue to um, build on the combination therapies and the immunotherapies that we have in the making. And hopefully, some of these targeted therapies will also evolve uh, to allow us to target this specific group of patients. So I'll stop there, and thank you for your attention.